Welcome to my third webcast uh, this Dynamic Range Day. Uh, thanks so much for joining me, uh, joining us. I have some guests who I'll introduce in a moment. I hope you've enjoyed the day. I've certainly had fun chatting to uh, the, my other guests on the, on the other webcasts. If you haven't seen those already, um, the replays are on the dynamicrangeday.com website, or you can go to the Facebook page and see them there, or my YouTube channel. And the replay for this will also be available afterwards. Um, hopefully, you guys can see me in reasonable quality. The bandwidth has been a bit of an issue, as you know, this week um, with all the heavy internet usage because of the unusual circumstances. Um, but hopefully, you can see me clearly. Um, to my guests, who I will bring in in a moment, if you see my picture quality degrade massively and stay that way, please let me know. I can switch to an alternative connection, which may help improve it. So I won't repeat the things I've already said on the, the other webcasts. Uh, you know, I wondered whether to run the event this year, and I decided that I should after talking to you guys, to the audience. Everybody seemed very much in favor of it. And so here we are. I have two guests definitely this evening and one extra one who I am have my fingers crossed he will be able to make it. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, telling you the winner of the award this year. Um, this is 2020, and the first Dynamic Range Day was in 2010, which means it's actually been 11 years in that weird way that anniversaries work. Um, but it seemed a fitting time to maybe try and take an overview of what has happened in those last 10 years, how the loudness wars have developed, where we came from, where we're going to. I'm seeing a message from somebody saying that the video quality is very poor already. Um, let me let me check that because if it is, I will switch. Um, just give me two seconds. It would be a shame to mess this up for the archive. It, yep, you're right. That's particularly poor, isn't it? Okay, bear with me. I'm going to drop out of the broadcast. The screen will go black briefly. Um, then I will come back in and hopefully things will have improved. Let me click that. Okay. Elko, can you hear me? Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? I see you speaking. Um, I can't hear you yet. Oh, there's. Okay, let me check the YouTube stream and see if the quality is any better. <laughs> uh, okay. We have audio. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we have audio. Okay, give me two seconds, guys, and then I'm going to start again for the archive. Um, thank you for letting me know. Uh, let's sort that out. I've lost one of my guests. I hope he can get back in. Okay, guys. I apologize for this unusual circumstances. Um, let me, I can't message that guest now. Um, Elko, please could you message Bob? Um, let me bring you in briefly. <laughs> um, everybody, Hi. this is Elko, he's one of my guests. I'm gonna take him out again. We're gonna start this whole thing afresh with the, the better video quality for the feed. Um, but could you message Bob, please, and ask him, try to tell him to try refreshing his browser window. I'm coming back Bob into is, uh, chatting at the moment. He says, uh, testing from Bob K. I'm here on chat. Okay. I hear you. He's, he writes. You don't see his okay. chat messages? I probably can if I click the right button. Just bear with me. Yeah, if you ref try refreshing your browser, Bob. Um, okay, he's gone. <laughs> 
Ah, live television in the time of coronavirus. Ah, there we go. Okay, great. Bob, I can hear you. Okay, so take two. Bear with me, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, and welcome to the third Dynamic Range Day webcast that I've done today. In fact, this is the fourth time I've done the introduction. I just had to restart the whole thing because of issues with the video quality. This has been a recurring theme this week with the real challenges that the heavy internet use has uh, put on the streaming services because of the coronavirus. Um, it's been an interesting time to run a virtual event, um, but I think we're winning now. Hopefully you guys can see me reasonably clearly. Uh, so it's 2020. The first Dynamic Range Day was in 2010. That's been 11 years, oddly enough. And I thought this would be a great time to take a moment to have some guests who have been involved in the, the issue of loudness for as long as I have been a mastering engineer, I believe, um, and try and maybe take an overview of what has happened in the last 10 years, where we've come from, where we're going to. Uh, I thought you guys might find that interesting. If you're watching this webcast, you're you're part of the the, the core audience for this event. Um, and thank you for being here. I, I really appreciate it. So I think without any further ado, I will ado, I will inter introduce my two guests. Um, so let's see whether this works. Here we have Bob Katz and Elko Grimm, who I'm sure will be familiar to many of you. Um, Bob obviously has been a campaigner on the issue of loudness for many years. Uh, and yes, when I was back as a trainee mastering engineer, I was chatting to him. I don't know whether he remembers that on uh, Glenn Meadows mastering web board forum um, amongst other people. And Elko uh, again has uh, been, was involved in the development of the R128 loudness specification back when that started. Um, he has his own audio company, Grim Audio. They make very super high-end audio gear. He's been a big guest on my podcast, and we we talked a lot about uh, that, the kind of the journey of the loudness standards over the years. And I thought it would be interesting just to kind of start by asking you guys at this point whether you're optimistic or not about where we are, whether you feel that we've made progress, are making progress, and whether you think things will continue to improve or not. Um, Bob, maybe I can start with you. Oh, Ian, I've got a big word of praise for you. <clears throat> I would say that your um, loudness penalty has helped me to, uh, to convince several clients um, I'll, I've I'll, here, let me share an email if I may and show you and, and lead into it. Okay. Share that. And I think, oh, not the screen application window. Here we go. Uh, this one. Okay. Um, what we have is a letter from a current client. I just finished mastering the whole album, and I decided to send him a quick master, uh, not a quick master, to send him a master of the first song in the album for their reactions. Their, their mix was so excellent, so transparent, so beautiful. It's a, it's a rocky folk kind of a group, and um, that I worked really hard to, um, to capture as much of that transparency as possible. Uh, would you like me to read along uh, and uh, explain what they, what what their reactions were? It's all means, yeah. Please do. Okay. Can you see the text? Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Hey, Bob. Thanks for sending this along. I oh, listen. Uh, pardon me. I nope. thought you were talking to me. Sorry. <laughs> oh, hey, well, Bob, that's going to be confusing. Yeah, let's pause for a moment and just just welcome our, our extra guest. Uh, Go right ahead. You want me to unshare? That's fine. I've just removed it. You can keep it shared and I'll bring it back in a second. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to say that my third guest, who I hoped would be able to make it, has been able to make it, uh, is a name that I'm sure is familiar to all of you. Uh, Bob Ludwig, who, I mean, is a legendary mastering engineer. Um, and perhaps something else I should say as part of 
the uh, my introduction introduction to, as to why these three gentlemen I've invited them on. Um, we are all they invited me to be part of their group, the Music Loudness Alliance. Um, they have been working together for years behind the scenes um, with Apple, with the AES, and with anybody they can speak to really to try and um, bring some sanity to the, this situation that we're presented with the, this the loudness war. Um, and they have all, in their own way, done Im immense things to to help with the situation. So, Bob, thank you, Bob Ludwig, thank oh, you so welcome. much for uh, for being here. And uh, yeah, let's let's go back. I had, was I was asking uh, Bob and Elko, and I'll ask you in a minute as well where um, they felt <clears throat> we were at this point after you know ten years that I've been doing Dynamic Range Day, and I guess maybe twenty years in the in the current loudness war. Whether they felt optimistic or not, whether they thought we had made progress, whether we are moving forward. Um, and yeah, Bob was sharing his his email um, from a client with us and talking about how, <clears throat> excuse me, he'd found the loudness penalty website helpful. Just remember, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is named Bob. Okay. <laughs> so, hey, Bob, it, this is from a current client. I decided uh, their music was so wonderful and the their, their recording so transparent that I really had to work extra hard to get the most out of the recording possible uh, without taking it downhill. And uh, so I decided, let's see what their reaction is, because I, I was pretty conservative about the processing for the, this kind of music. Uh, and so here's what they said. Hey, Bob, thanks for sending this along. I listened to it with my bass player, and we really think it sounds great. The master is very transparent and yet seems to glue everything together nicely. And the low, low mid seem to be coming through more than before, which helps fill out the sound. We don't have any critical feedback to offer, but we did notice two things, though, both of which are probably non-issues from your perspective. So he noticed a little blip, and that was because I, I didn't pay attention to um, heading, heading and tailing this quick sample that I sent to them. So it had some uh, extra stuff at the head and tail. But the, the level, they noticed, was slightly lower than some comparison tracks we listened to. But I know there are probably a dozen different variables to consider in this regard. We were using MP3s from similar genres to compare. And then he writes, I know Spotify <clears throat> and Apple Music do some processing of tracks on their platforms. Again, we are not audiophiles. I just wanted to mention it. As long as the level is comparable to other tracks from similar artists, when people listen on Spotify or Apple Music, and to a lesser extent CDs, then we'll be happy. And we trust you to get us there. So I responded by dragging and dropping uh, this master that I made, this test master that I made onto uh, Ian's loudness penalty. And it showed that Spotify would raise its gain 1 dB. I said, well, we're certainly in the ballpark for Spotify. And I told him not to worry. And uh, so, the, and I explained that on Apple Music, it didn't default to being normalized and that on CD, it might seem lower than many CDs, but uh, they seemed quite satisfied. And uh, so congratulations, Ian, for loudnesspenalty.com. You're helping everybody. Well, thank you. I mean, you know, that's, that's great to hear because that's exactly what I had hoped um, might happen uh, when we when we created the site. Uh, and my, so, my picture is frozen, by the way. Do you still see yeah. it? I'm waving my hand and I don't. No, you, you have frozen. I don't know whether it's worth trying refreshing again and coming back in. Um, I'll try it. OK. Um, but yeah, for anybody, I'm sure anybody listening has already kind of found the loudness penalty site themselves. Um, that was exactly what we hoped for it. We, you know, we chose a slightly controversial name, and I have taken some heat from uh, the industry uh, because of that. Um, you know, people feel that it's provocative. It was deliberately provocative. We wanted to get people thinking about these issues, um, and. I hope that more professionals will experiment with using it, even though uh, perhaps it the, the name might be slightly off-putting, just because it is great evidence to people that it is safe to add uh, or to release music with the dynamics and that it will work um, 
on the widest possible range of, of streaming services. So that's great to hear. Um, I want to check in with Bob L um, and just see how much time you have, sir, because I greatly appreciate you being here and I don't want you to kind of sit there listening to all of us talk and then have to leave. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I felt like I spent the last 17 minutes finding out that this uh, streaming service doesn't work with Safari. So I had to like download Firefox and align it and it's all on my wife's oh. computer. We couldn't remember our <laughs> passwords for all these things. So it was, it was very stressful. It's a stressful day to begin with, with the uh, uh, coronavirus situation. City well, of just before, yeah, I mean, just before you joined us, I had had to restart because the video connection from here on my normal connection was so poor. I'm now actually piggybacking off my phone's data connection to be here. So, yeah, it, everything at the moment is stressful. So, uh, yeah, we appreciate it. But do you have kind of uh, 20 minutes, half an hour? Uh, 20 minutes anyway, yeah. Okay, great. Um, in that case, I will ask you next what your uh, feeling is about where we are um, at this stage. You know, do you feel we've made progress over the last ten years? Are you getting has has the the introduction of the streaming normalization meant that people are requesting more dynamic masters from you? Has nothing really changed? How do you feel about it? Well, <clears throat> having been with this uh, loudness group for a long time since the beginning and seeing we, we thought that when uh, apple was going to uh, uh, make sound check the default we thought that was going to be the end of the loudness war and of course apple never really kind of did that and and then spotify i think pretty much you could say that spotify has it on by default now is that true yeah basically yeah so it took a long time for that to happen but in the meantime something we'd never even considered uh that would be go against us is the mix engineers themselves because of the uh previous collapse of the record industry before it regained its footing to the some crazy amount of money they make every hour um the engineers felt like in, in order to compete with one of them for each other to in other words to get the mix job they had to make their mix as loud as they could possibly make it most times louder than I would have ever thought to do in mastering. And of course, uh, that's like the the poison apple. Like, because everything is based on comparison. Like, if you listen to something, you compare it to other things, you say, okay, it's in the ballpark. But then if this uh, mixing engineer puts something in with it, you know, uh, at minus seven LFUS, um, LUFS, sorry, um, it's so loud and they and they get used to it. And so you, anything that's not that loud isn't good enough for them. And I, it was such from such a left field kind of a thing. We just never expected that to happen like that, And but it has. And for me now, by far, that's the, the most difficult thing to uh, deal with with the loudness wars now is trying to read, you know, trying to convince these mix engineers not to make their listening copies quite so loud, give me a little bit of headroom, you know? So it's, on the other hand, there's been mm, one client that's told me what uh, LUFS uh, loudness value he wants for his record. One client in all these years. So uh, that's discouraging. Yet, um, there more and more people are uh, aware of it now. And certainly, I'm sure you've probably already discussed, like I, have to spend a lot of time educating my clients and talk to them about the streaming and try to make them compare, like, you know, put it on your iTunes software and turn sound check on and then compare everything and see what you think. And, um, but there's quite a few groups like, um, uh, a couple of heavy metal groups, even, uh, that I worked with, I would do the, uh, some test cuts at different levels and, uh, let them decide, how much of a hit they want to have for uh, the loud dynamics. And several of them, about four of them, in fact, have come back to me with things that were not as loud. Uh, it, it's very good. Like I usually like to have some compression uh, or many mixes need some to make it sound as good as I think it can sound. And so I guess the point is that all these, these four groups have made records that I thought was at the right level. Uh, and not this uh, level for uh, compression for compression itself. Um, so yeah. that's been encouraging. No, I mean, 
Absolutely. I mean, that that's fantastic to to hear. And you know, it's interesting, really. I've I've said this on a couple of the the streams today already. In a in a genre that is basically not all about being loud, but where being loud is super important. It's kind of ironic that I think metal is one of the the first genres where we're consistently seeing a move to more towards more dynamic material. Kind of generally, I would I would agree. I've I've seen more dynamic uh, metal releases and and. A lot of the, uh, you know, supporters of Dynamic Range Day um, and people who talk to me on my my, my site and my, on Facebook and social media are um, metal musicians or metal fans as well. So I think that's a that's a really interesting trend. Um, I've seen it in my metal and hard rock clients as well. A yeah. few, at least a few. Yeah, that's good. Listen, um, Alco, I want to talk to you as well because you've done some really interesting work with. Uh, Tidal uh, to do with the normalization, um, and obviously normalization is a controversial topic. But uh, since Bob L's time uh, is limited, if it's okay with you, I'll just move that a little bit later in our schedule this evening, um, so that we can move straight on to the, the Dynamic Range Day Award this year, um, because I would like Bob to be here for for that. I think he will be interested in one of the nominees. Um, Sure, no problem, uh, Ian. Maybe, maybe okay. I can add just one tiny comment still to this uh, discussion, and it is uh, two actually, two short ones. One is that in the indie music world, I see a lot of people responding quite well to the fact that Spotify is using minus fourteen and loves approximately for the the, the, the track normalization or loudest track if it's an album. And um, so some of my friends who are into mixing and mastering of indie bands, they they really don't have any issue anymore with loudness and they can mix and master at minus 14 loves without any problem. And I'm seeing really crazy good albums here in the Netherlands now. Um, so that that's really encouraging because at least some people can already take advantage of the new rules, so to say. Um, and then the other side is that I also uh, learned from electronic dance music, EDM, that it's not that Spotify will help them to normalize because they will, their, their, their main uh, platform podium is, of course, the, the live event, although that's not possible at this very moment. But normally that's their platform. And uh, all the live sound systems have limiters built in so the DJs won't um, go too loud. But the uh, effect of that is that it causes a new loudness war because everybody wants to be as loud as possible until the limiter kicks in. And uh, this is really, really a big problem. So a positive and a negative note for me. Yeah, I, th I think that's a fair summary, really. Of I mean, that's the way that I feel as well. I see positives. I see much more dynamic releases that I'm very excited about. And then I see even more extreme over compression and so much mainstream pop, uh, especially, that is just not necessarily completely crushed, but just way louder than it needed to be. Um, especially given the, the streaming thing. So, um, yeah, I, I, think, wish, I, think I wish we could find another word than way louder because really what happens is the louder you make it, the more processing has to be applied. And that is what's messing it up. Absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah, in fact, uh, Russell Cotier, who's a UK producer here, and um, I talked to him last Dynamic Range Day. I think he's just uh, started talking about, he's inverted the way he talks about it. He talks about the loud stuff as wimpy um and yeah. uh, the quiet stuff is punchy you know which i think you know i mean that's the way that it can <laughs> across um okay great um elko i'd like to come back to you um sure. so and anybody who's seen the webcast will know that we like to have an informal q a session at the end and i'm sure there'll be more time to talk to um uh, both elko and bob if they're able to stick around then but how um, long is this going ian Okay, so uh, I think about another ten minutes to, or five or ten minutes for just to announce the um, the award, um, and then uh, yeah, then then we basically just let it let it run until the wheels come off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All um, right, I'll try to stick around to the first Q and A then. <laughs> okay, that'd be great. But, um, okay, in which case, so to you, I have to say. <laughs> Yeah, it's great for all of us to see each other. We, we all kind of talk via email and occasionally bump in into each other on AES working groups, which is another thing I want to talk to Bob about. The AES has been very important in the whole loudness story. But uh, yeah, let's do the award um, and then we don't have to worry too much about the time. 
Um, so just briefly, I mean, you know, there. If I'm honest, I haven't seen. I was really excited. You all know, two or three years ago, because we had uh, the Mark Ronson um, album with Uptown Funk on it. We had Get Lucky. We had Daft Punk. There was a slew of really big, decently dynamic releases, um, and I was really hopeful that that was going to kind of be the the turning of the tide. I can't say that that has proven to be the case, if I'm honest. Um, and it it's, can sometimes be f hard to find um, great sounding dynamic releases, but I do have some for you guys to to listen to. So um, some of the, my favorites from the, the shortlist this year were um, FKA Twigs, Magdalene, which was proposed by Elko, which uh, it's not a perfect album. The first track in particular has quite a lot of clipping distortion in it, but it is genuinely dynamic. Um, it's not stupidly loud. Um, overall and some of the songs sound absolutely great and it's a great mainstream album which is something that i particularly want to highlight with the uh with the award is to show people that it's possible to be you know current and successful and have dynamics so um the Bye. next album is uh be be up a hello by square pusher um in fact now i look at the list there are several um electronica i wouldn't say uh dance acts but certainly electronica acts in the, the shortlist this year. I think that's another genre where some artists at least are backing away from the kind of the extreme levels we've seen over the years. Um, Mock Deer, The Art of Loneliness, which was mastered by our very own Bob Katz. Um, the new album, by, I never know how to say this band's name, whether it was played or plaid, um, but the new album by them, Polymer, um, is uh, fantastic. Personal favorite of mine is the new Underworld album, um mustard at abbey road sounds amazing beautifully done beautiful sounding album if you haven't heard drift series one i highly encourage you if you like a bit of um old school electronica i highly recommend you go and check it out um i didn't put it on the short list this year because it's not technically a new album but avenged sevenfold who won the award uh, oh, years yeah. ago so go ahead bob no i've heard of them go ahead yeah, absolutely <laughs> Um, yeah. and that's a great, uh, that's actually a re-release, I think, of an old album by them. But so many re-releases these days uh, are pushed to modern levels uh, unnecessarily. And that's a great dynamic sounding uh, record. Uh, Making a New World by Field Music. Uh, Field Music have been on the shortlist before. That's a fantastic album. They always have great sound quality and, and dynamics in their releases. And finally, uh, Fear Inoculum by Tool which was mastered by Bob Ludwig, who just happens to be on the call this evening. So congratulations to all the nominees. Uh, this is where I need my drum roll sound effect, but I don't have one, unfortunately. Um, so it gives me great pleasure, and it may not surprise many people watching this uh, to know that the winner this year is Fear Inoculum by Tool, and congratulations to Bob Ludwig for that. I think I counted this up right, that that's five times, Bob, that you have won the Dynamic Range Day award um out of 11 years wow. um we think there was the Avenged sevenfold album there was uh not the white stripes but the uh the solo album um oh, yep that's the one um random access memories yeah. um this one and one more i mean and it's not i promise everybody watching and listening it's not a stitch up <laughs> <laughs> um it's why bob is such an important part of this group and uh, you know, he, he he's not like me. He doesn't get out and shout about it from the rooftops. He's just kind of quietly getting on, mastering all of these amazing records, and I believe offering most clients a choice between a louder version or not, and then yeah, you know, going with their, with their choice, respecting their wishes, which I respect as a as a method of working. Um, so, Bob, congratulations and thank you thank for. You you know, sticking to your guns and um, persuading so many of these these big artists um, to, you know, to kind of back away from the loudness cliff and to just allow the, the music a little more room to breathe because, you know, I think it sounds so much better as a result. Yeah, well, you have to have your hats off to Tools, the band. I mean, uh, Danny Carey, the drummer, is an audiophile. He has the smaller Eggleston work speakers than mine. I've got the Ivies. He has the Savoy um which i think is what darcy uh masters off of and um they i remember once they walked in saying we don't want to have the loudest record i just want to hear the sound 
of the end of my drumstick hitting the calves, calfskin uh, drum head. And so, um, so that was that was great. That was really great. And uh, there, I mean, their record does sound really amazing. Uh, Joe Barisi, who mixed it just now, he really um, did white glove treatment to them from their whole recording uh, process, which was very, very, very long uh, through the mixing process and then through the mastering process. He was um, ace. He, and he says he's a really great guy and a great mixer. So. Uh, it's wonderful when you get records that really give you chills when you listen to it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the other great thing is to, to see what a fantastic reaction there was to the album. I mean, and, and this really is the message, I think, of the award. There's been a fantastic reaction to all of the albums that have won over the years, you know, and it just kind of proves proves the point that the reason that I started doing it was I wanted to show that. Um, for anybody who's paying attention, um, mm -hmm. it is possible to to be successful and to to be current and to be a big name artist um, and to take what is seen as a risk, but is not really. I mean, particularly in this day and age where most people listen online, so they hear it with the the loudness evened out. So you know, you're not going to get beaten by the loud stuff in in the same way. Um, At least on Spotify. Well, I mean, I think the thing, the thing is, I mean, the, the stat that I like to quote is from 2017. I, I should get an updated version of it. But that showed that 87 percent of the music industry revenue in the U.S. in 2017 came from non-physical media, which basically means streaming and downloads, which I mean, I don't know what proportion of that. Well, maybe this is a moment to bring Elko in because, Elko, you've worked with um, Tidal on their loudness normalization. Um, and the interesting thing about it is that they used album normalization instead of track normalization, which perhaps we can touch on in a minute. Um, but you were saying to me that only 7.5% of their users have disabled normalization. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's what they told me. It was the uh, the Android users, I have to say. Um, so it was on their uh, mobile apps at first. Now it's also on the desktop. And I got some numbers from their, their, their Android users. And uh, you could see people turning it off and on again. And if you then uh, do the equation, uh, you you come to about 7.5% of the people who turned it off. And they said, that's real. That's that's not too many. It's uh, it, 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 With some other changes they did, they, they found more people uh, turning it off. And uh, and apart from that, they had no massive complaints at all, and uh, there were few calls to customer service, and most of them uh, were just calls out of curiosity what this new feature means, and uh, so they were enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that's great to hear, Bob. Did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to say I, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of those Android users are listening in the gym or while jogging or in a noisy city or on a bus. And uh, that's possible that that's the reason. Well, it's, it's possible, but I think, um, I mean, it, it's almost more important perhaps that there haven't been complaints because the, the interesting thing I think about Tidal's version of normalization is instead of making every song the same loudness, um, they use album normalization. So they will measure the loudest song on an album and turn all the songs on that album down by the same amount, which retains the artistic variation from song to song that was the original intent of the album. Um, and the the kind of, I think that was quite a risky thing to do. I mean, that's based on the research that Elko did for them, um, which showed that people preferred it that way. Um, yeah. But I think the great, the great news is that they didn't complain about that. You know, it obviously works. It's obviously the, you know, this larger majority, not just the kind of the test group that Elka used, but the, the world at large think that this is a great way to use normalization and gives them a satisfying listening experience. And I think that's really encouraging to see indeed. And it's important to note that if you use Spotify and you play a full album, it also uh, changes to album normalization. So the main difference between Spotify and Tidal is that Tidal is using this, the, 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 the variations between the loudnesses of the various tracks always. Also, if you have, let's say, a playlist with tracks from various albums, they would still maintain the, 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 the relative loudnesses that exist on the album. 
And uh, this is what I tested with the 38 subjects. And uh, with that group, 71% uh, of the people preferred the album normalization uh, situation always. Uh, but then Tidal really uh, got the courage to, 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 to just use it. Um, also, actually, because uh, they, they actually they, they, they refrained from turning loudness normalization on by default because they felt that for their target group, track normalization would not work. And so when I uh, this, this, did this research and, and showed to them that uh, the majority of people would prefer to have album normalization used always, that actually um, well, made them accept the whole concept of loudness normalization to begin with. And then when they took, had the courage to turn it on and uh, they found out that only 7.5% of the people turned it off, I think that's, that's a real big success. Absolutely. There's, Go ahead. Thanks. There's a hidden advantage to album normalization. Um, it keeps things from overloading because if you start with the loudest track and you normalize that, then you can keep a lot of the other tracks from overloading. I, I actually have some numbers to that, if you would like to hear that. Um, Absolutely. So, um, but but maybe what, you can do that later, no problem, whatever you like. What, what I was going to say was, I was just going to ask, I'm, I'm seeing uh, if anybody in, wants to throw in any questions for particularly uh, Bob Ludwig before he has to go in the comments, um, please go ahead and do that. I'll keep an eye on them. Um, but yeah, I think it'd be interesting to see those numbers maybe, Alko. Okay. Yeah, well, it's it's just briefly. Um, if if you normalize the loudest, well, uh, to, to be clear, I I analyzed the full tidal database uh, three years ago, and at, at the time it were four point two million albums. So I did the full statistical analysis on that, mm -hmm. and um, uh, well, for this number, I found out that if you would normalize uh, using album normalization, so you you have the same loudness for the loudest tracks of all albums and you would align it to minus 14 loves, you would cover 87% of the albums of the full catalog and they would all be perfectly normalized. And um, if you use minus 14 loves, then still 72% of the softest tracks, which is also the pretty large majority, would still sit above minus 20 loves, which is uh, in the AES uh, recommendation TD-1004, let's say the, the lower level that we should stay above to, on the current uh, uh, versions of mobile phones. So that means that this, this, this really works fine. Now, if we would change to track normalization instead, um, you need to know that 50%, so half of the full catalog of Tidal, of the soft tracks are softer than minus 14 loves. So if you would do, use track normalization, um, the minus 14 loves target is too high. We have to go lower. We have to go to minus 16 at least. And then still 37% uh, of the track of the softer tracks would be softer than that. So I think that uh, using album normalization always um, has more advantages than just uh, keeping the artistic intent of the mastering engineer. It also offers you a much better normalization on the majority of tracks. Interesting. Yeah. Great. No, I, I think you know the, the whole thing is very positive. I mean, it's, it's interesting just looking at the comments here because um, there's quite a few people with quibbles about loudness normalization, and that's certainly something that I get. You know, I've been. I remember writing a blog post years ago saying uh, Spotify will end the loudness war, and I was clearly a bit ahead of my my time with that. Hey, stuff. I got into that trap before. Yeah, absolutely. We've all been there thinking that this this stuff is going to solve solve the problem, but and and now we're in a situation where loudness normalization is kind of everywhere, but it is challenging for everybody because it's inconsistent. You get different results on the different services. Um, YouTube sometimes doesn't normalize anything at, at all. Um, you know the Spotify. Nothing. I thought I thought they had that working. Oh, they're they're um, it's getting there, but there are still songs out there that have no that will pop out really really loud because they haven't been normalized at all. Um, it's I mean I think they're improving it. They you know it's it's just an incremental process. There's just so much stuff up there. I just imagine it takes time for everything to get kind of logged and registered. Um, but it does make it 
you know, I, I get lots of people kind of messaging, just kind of frustrated going, oh, you keep going on about Latin normalization. It's just a nightmare for us. You know, why can't it go back to the old way where we knew how, where we were and how loud it was? For me personally, I feel like it's better than it was. And I think the thing that I take away from it is it's improving. You know, the, if, if we could encourage all of the services to start using the same system that Tidal has, as Eoka describes, I think people's experience of loudness normalization would get better. I think it's really good that YouTube are now using LUFS because then there's consistency between them and Amazon Music and Tidal. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, well, Spotify have said they will move to LUFS in future. So I kind of, I feel like, I think I said this last year, so I apologize for anybody who's, I feel like we're still in this kind of time of, of change where everything is is moving and shifting. Um, and uh, yeah, go ahead, Elka. Yeah, uh, in, in this this this, this thread, um, I see a question by uh, D.F. Rodriguez, and he asks if there's a committee set up at the AES to address setting up guides for the streaming companies to establish a final set level and uh well we can indeed confirm that this is uh this this committee is working uh for about a year now on this and we hoped to have any results still this year although this year is looking completely different than anyone would ever have expected uh, but uh, we still have good hopes uh, that we will be able to to come to a recommendation uh, uh, Bob Katz can tell more about that but I think it's important to notice that um, there's work going on to harmonize uh, all the various uh, streaming services uh, by offering them a, a guidelines uh, as AES groups yeah I, I, I completely agree and perhaps um, we'll do a few questions and then we could talk some more perhaps about um, because we've all been involved in one way or another with the AES and I think their work is is very positive and I did have a couple of questions specifically for Bob Katz um, about uh, loudness and uh, normalization we have a question here I don't know whether you can see it on screen from Andrea uh, for Bob Ludwig he says can we expect more metal albums mastered by you in the near future um, he's looking forward to more stuff that sounds as good as Avenged Sevenfolds the stage um, I don't know whether you can, you probably can't reveal who your upcoming clients are, can you, Bob? I can't, but I can say that there are some metal albums coming up in the near future that have that. So um, one of them is uh, uh, one of those remasters of a very famous, uh, in fact, it's the biggest uh, heavy metal record ever. So if you know who that, what that is, you'll know what it is. Um, anyway, that uh, we're able to get some good dynamics on that and had a couple of different levels and the group went with a dynamic version. And then um, I'm doing this, what is it? It's a two and a half hour show um, for a metal band for a Blu-ray in both stereo and surround. And again, we did a couple of levels and the producer um, of the group um, said, well, we should make something louder for the CD. And because uh, he says, I love the way you're, what, what it, the, what, love the way it sounds now, but maybe for the CD, it should be louder. So I did him a test cut. Um, I think it was like only one and a half or two dB louder. And he says, you know, we're going to scrap that. We'll just go with the dynamic level for everything. So uh, that was so encouraging. And the records, is, uh, it's awesome. And, and it's not me, it's the mixer and, and the guys. But uh, so there are at least two uh, heavy metal records coming out in the future that uh, um, will be, I think, really exceptionally good sounding. So. Oh, that's that's great to hear. I'm going yeah. to look forward to that. Um, in fact, there's a related question here from Alex, who wanted to know our opinion on the the practice of sometimes um, the vinyl master being more dynamic than the digital one, which is kind of what you were just talking about there, I guess, Bob. I mean, I mean, I've always said that if I could master everything as though it was going to be on vinyl, I would be happy, and everybody else would be happy as well. Because if you master it as though it's going to be on vinyl, you're going to get a great master that will work um, anywhere. Um, I mean, it's, I know yeah. that, that there, that, there are, uh, I can't think of the titles off the top of my head, but we've done some where we've done the two levels and the manager of the group decides to use both levels and use the more dynamic one for the uh, vinyl and use the louder one for the CD and downloads. But uh, uh, so that does happen. And it that actually happens more often than not. Like uh, the vinyl will be done from one that I, did a test cut of a, di a dynamic version that they decided not to go with for everything else. So, but there's yeah. no te no technical reason for that. I think we need to emphasize 
CD has plenty of range. And if you master for CD, the, like, like we just said, the way records used to be made in 1980, it'll fit just fine on the CD. There's no worry about losing anything except if you play that CD in a, it, it, what happens is when you play it in a changer or one against another. And so I say, thank goodness CDs are dying in that respect. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, there's another question here specifically for Bob uh, Ludwig. Uh, Viola asks, may I ask, what is your personal favorite genre of music? Oh, that's difficult to say. Um, I enjoy any kind of music that's really well done. And so that includes everything from country to metal to classical music. I mean, I went to the Eastman School of Music and I have a master's degree in music at um, trumpet and music literature, and I have a bachelor's in music education. And um, so coming from Eastman, I had a very strong classical background. And one of the things, even though I just won this year's Grammy was for um, the Terry Riley classical record I did, um, it was uh, kind of not the normal situation. So uh, at home, very often I'll listen to contemporary classical music, people like uh, Morton Feldman I like a lot and uh i've worked with elliot carter and john cage and i got to spend a whole day with john cage once which is a whole nother story <laughs> but uh so i enjoy that and the reason i listen to that is because it's uh i don't get enough of it at work but um but i listen to everything you'd be shocked if uh sometimes when my daughters are here on a visit i'll put my uh ipad into or iphone into uh, shuffle mode and see how fast I can identify all the different songs that come up, and uh, and, and it's just amazing that the, the the jumble of music that I have on my uh, iPhone is just staggering. The, the, you know, it goes from Phil Spector to, like I say, it's six-hour Morton Feldman string quartet. You know, so it's everything in between. It's interesting. I think quite a lot of uh, mastering engineers have some kind of classical music background. I'm I'm classically trained. Um, I think. Bob, do you have classical connections? Bob Katz? I played the clarinet from the age of 10. Wow. Do you hear that me? counts? That counts. Aoko, how about you? I, I sing in a classical choir. <laughs> <laughs> and I studied sonology, so modern yeah. electronic uh, music, yeah. That counts as well. And just on a complete tangent, um, if anybody knows of a, uh, a way that musicians can rehearse together remotely, Oh, and um, keep in time. time. <laughs> yeah, and keep in time. There's lots of people who want to know that. If there's somebody developing that technology, the next six months is the time to release it. There's a um, a video going around uh, from Berkeley College of Music called uh, about the Bur with the Burke Backrack. What the world needs now is love, and mm -hmm. it has all the musicians performing in their homes. But you can be sure that it was assembled in a session later. It, it, they didn't. Ha they didn't do it live. Everyone was overdubbing to uh to a track i don't know if the, it's possible with the latency of the internet to uh do it live i think i think it's very difficult difficult um there's a, a question here again for bob ludwig um are you still convincing clients with the youtube loudness war video which and i guess he's talking about the one that matt mayfield did oh, yeah. uh, in fact uh bob katz and elko and i uh there's an updated version of that as part of the we started a petition to uh, try and persuade the streaming companies to use loudness normalization. And I think now we should be changing it to persuade them to use a lower loudness normalization level, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I, Bob, do you, do you still use that video? And, uh, yeah, I still have a way of convincing I, people. I've gone back to the original one. Uh, the one that you guys made is like too, too complicated for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need something that's really simple like the first one, so it's great. <laughs> Um, okay, let me uh, see if there's any other questions here. Um, actually, Bob Ludwig, I was going to ask you whether um, I mean, you were talking about the, the problem that you have or the challenge that you have with mixes sending mixes hot. Um, another place that people often say they get pressure to make stuff louder than they might otherwise choose to is from you know major record companies. Um, has that changed at all, or is that pretty pretty much a constant? Because I think here, there, there is a kind of case of we need to persuade 
not necessarily the artists or the engineers, but you know the people in the different levels of the the music industry. What's your opinion about yeah, that? Yeah, well, you know the whole chain of uh, approvals is very paranoid. You know, between the, the the engineer, the artist, sometimes there's a recording engineer and a mix engineer, and the A and R people. Uh, if just one of them says, "Oh, I think it should be louder," the others go like, "Okay," you know that kind of thing. So it is. There is still a lot of paranoia about that. Um, but, you know, it, I, I think most of it is from those mix engineers who are just so afraid of losing their, uh, their job compared to somebody else, you know, uh, it's really, you know, and the, the thing that's, uh, happens, uh, like when that first started happening, uh, we would, they would never send us the, the files that they were listening to. Can you imagine that sending an album? to a mastering engineer and not letting him hear what everyone else has been listening to. It's the height of insanity to do that. But that's what people used to do. And so I would master something and I'd get the reaction like, well, Bob, this is very boring. It's not anywhere near as good as the flat mixes. And I went, what do you mean? It's five dB louder than the flat mixes. And then they'd play this listening copy that was 10 dB louder, you know? So that's what we have to deal with, yeah. yeah. No, it's it's a crazy mixed up world, um, and it's well, especially now, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, kind of add extra things on top. I mean, if I can share a little success story that I had recently, I um I mastered an album several years ago. In fact, for the band, um, the band's called Esthesis, I believe. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. And it's the the music that I used as the soundtrack for the Dynamic Range Day promo video that has kind of little snippets of things from several of us here. Um, so I mastered that album. I, I loved it. It's kind of prog rock with with violins. Um, uh, really, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. It's one of those things where I, I loved the music as well as enjoyed just working on the the audio. Um, and they contacted me again this year to to ask me to do a new album for them, which I was very pleased about. So I sent back a test master. I didn't go go through my usual thing of old oh, loudness, this you know reference tracks because I thought, well, I know where I am with this band. Obviously, they'd come back to me because they liked what I did before. Um, and the first set of comments came back and they said, oh, it sounds flat and lifeless and, and you know, my heart sank. And it, so, but I, so I asked them to send me some reference tracks and they sent me a little kind of MP3 of all of these examples snipped together. And of course they weren't loudness matched. So I emailed them back and said, uh, sent them another version. I said, okay, all I've done is instead of, cause they'd done another one where they turned theirs up to match these reference tracks and says, look, see, it works better like that. Can you just make ours louder? So I sent them back one back and I said, all I've done that's different is I've turned down the other tracks so that they're all the same level as your master, which is exactly what will happen on YouTube and everywhere else. Um, and some of them still sounded pretty good and some of them sounded absolutely terrible, I have to say. <laughs> anyway, cut a long story short, um, they went for my master, they went for the more dynamic version, they found that persuasive. Um, which you know, I was really relieved about because I, uh, I didn't want to be in the position of kind of having to to do something to this music that I didn't feel was was right for them. So I think that's just another positive example of of the way that things hopefully are in, improving. Um, and uh, oh, there's a question I don't understand. Um, question for Mr. Ludwig: Is there any way to increase? Is there any increase of mastering 8D music tracks? Does anybody know what HD is? HD, maybe? HD? Oh, HD. No, I, I think it's 8D. Um, oh, we'll have to come back to that one another time. Um, technical really question, are you working hybrid or analog or only in the box these days? Um, I think both of you, Bob's, work hybrid, I believe, or is that uh, correct? It depends. I do hybrid, but then if... It's like something from Bob Clear Mountain, where it's so close, just as it is, going two chips through converters doesn't really seem to help it. So uh, I'll do those things on the box. And uh, as you know, the, the, the plugins and the design of the DAWs have gotten better, um, there's less and less need to uh, use some favorite hybrid piece of gear. But since I just happened to mention that, one thing to know is that universal audio um, does the most terrible thing. They, there's a whole bunch of their plugins that they say are good for 96K 
and above, but in fact, they brick wall at 29 kilohertz. And so you're thinking that you're going to submit a high resolution uh, track to HD tracks to sell. And they say, well, we can't really sell it as 96K because it's a brick walls at 29 kilohertz. So um, it behooves you to find out which of the UAD uh, uh, plugins are full bandwidth and which aren't. You know, for instance, the Apogee Pooltech uh, uh, plugin that they have that was very carefully modeled on Bob uh, Clear Mountain's Pooltech, those are full bandwidth and not that bad a hit on the DSP, whereas UAD, their Pooltechs do do that 29 kilohertz uh, bandwidth limiting. And the same with the Manly uh, Massive Passive too. So, the main reason they do it is to fit more um, plugins on the same chip. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, Bob, this is this is where you get to say your your catchphrase: "Never turn your back on digital." <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. But you know, someday somebody's got to make a, a software. Like, it, for instance, look at the new Apple uh, Pro computer that they have. Um, the thing is useless at the moment because none of the software that's written addresses all that power. So you know, you have the same crashes as we do now because there's not enough computer power and there it is sitting there, but uh, they need to make computer software that will address all those cores and parallel processing and all that. It's just crazy in 2020 that we have uh, digital workstations that crash because they run out of DSP. That's just insane for that to be that way. But that's the way it is. You know? And I'm not happy to it. I really got to go. <laughs> okay. Well, no, we, we all agree with you. And I just want to say one more time, thank you so much for, for being with us, uh, Bob. We, we really appreciate it. And thank you for all your work on all those great albums over the years. And I'm sure we're all looking forward to many more from you in future. Um, thank you. So it's great yeah. to see you, Bob. Right. And the snow on the ground, too. I saw it in the back of the window. Oh, good. <laughs> all right. Take care. Take care, Bob. Okay. Stay safe. Thanks, Oko. Yep. Um, Okay, so we now know what AD audio is. Apparently, it's binaural audio. Um, somebody has answered that uh, in the questions. So, uh, wow, well, I'm so pleased that uh, Bob was able to make it. Okay, now we should go back and um, deal with some of those topics that I said we were going to deal with, um, and we kind of diverted so that um, I could make sure that Bob got the award. Um, I just, I just um, got a, a text message from Alan Silverman. He says the new Billie Eilish track, quote, everything I wanted is in 8D audio, whatever that means for us. OK, so somebody sent me that earlier on today, I think, and I listened to it on my mobile phone. And it has it basically kind of the whole thing wanders around your head while you're listening to it. It's, 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 very, um, it, it's very, very convincing. Um, I'm not sure whether it's musically appropriate because <laughs> <laughs> um, I found it quite distracting, um, but if I guess the interesting thing about that is it was presumably artificially created. Um, yeah, because there are a lot of tools that I have that can do that sort of thing. Mm. Okay. Oh well, I'm going to have to chat to you offline then and find out about that because I, I love binaural. Um, I'm fascinated by it. Um, let's um, let's let's. We didn't talk about the AES. Um, Bob, maybe you can just kind of give us an overview of the the kind of stuff that's happening in the AES, what they're doing, and why it's important. What you think maybe. They have achieved over the last 10 years and where we're going in the next few years i know that's a big ask you've got four minutes <laughs> <laughs> well what has the aes achieved um was the original recommendation which um all all of us guys tried to promote in the um, the petition but you know uh, i don't think that uh anyone has paid attention sadly, to the recommendation and that uh, we're just hoping and praying that um, that there will be more movement and that, uh, that we have Spotify and uh, a, a representative from Tidal and uh, CD Baby and a few others in our um, big streaming loudness group. And um, if we can come up with a, rec a new recommendation that people will pay more attention to, which I'll, I can show you the uh, work in progress and we'll see how it goes and it can't be easily turned into a standard that would be wonderful but um 
it, to turn it into a standard, which means it has an edict kind of an effect, it's a lot harder. Um, so it's still a recommendation. And I think that um, we just have to, to hope that um, it honestly, if I, I think if Spotify could lower their target even by 2 dB, it would be a revolution. And uh, that's that would be the the biggest goal that we could achieve, and we're we're trying, but it's very hard. There's a lot of resistance. So if you'd like to see the the paragraphs, I'll share the screen, and I'll just show you what we're working towards. It's just um, four or five bullet points that summarize it. So okay. let me. Um, yeah. And it's interesting what you're saying there, because that actually relates to. I, I mentioned to you that I had a, a couple of questions that came in directly for you. Um, and the, the second one of those was was asking why it, it came from Steve Bailey. He was saying the recommendations of the AES were later adopted and um, became legislation for broadcast regulations. Why hasn't oh, the same that, been done for streaming? That wasn't the AES. That was uh, both EBU and uh, ITU. Uh, the, AES. the AES recommendations are we're, we're trying our thing and we'll see how it goes. At least we have a big committee and um, a lot of um, representatives from streamers on there. Do you want me to make this a little larger, or can you read the number three current recommendations? Um, I make can't read it here, but I have a fairly small window. You could try. How about, it. How about that? It's bigger. Try again. It. Okay. Uh, how about that? Or no, that's not. That's not being reflected in the screen. I think you'll have to uh, just just summarize it for us. Okay. Topic error message. Is that the correct thing? Where? What error message? No, I'm just saying that it's. Are you showing us a page from the showcase support forum? I think that might no, be. No, I'm not. I picked the wrong one. Then let me try again. <laughs> uh, hold on. Where are you? It's hard because I get these tiny icons that show me what is on screen. And I picked, oh my God, so many pictures. Well, this is what I picked. Uh, try again. OK. OK, there, there we go. That, that's OK. It. Want me to try making that larger, or can you read No, that, that's that's fine. That's, that's quite legible. Okay. OK, so I'll read it out loud. This is. The gist of boiling it down, what recommendation we're going for. The target integrated loudness of the entire stream or file is going to be minus 18 LUFs for satisfactory audio quality with most content and the majority of current consumer devices. Now, that's a couple of dB below the the, it's actually at the same level of the original recommendation. The original recommendation had a range from minus 20 to minus 16, and it, it, nobody understood it. And I think that was part of the reason why it, it didn't get any ground, is people said, well, uh, okay, if it can go from minus 16 to minus 20, then let's go for the loudest one. We want to be louder. So uh, everybody went for minus 16 if they could. And of course, very few, if any, of the streaming services except uh, Tidal actually listened. Um, but we're finally getting a few. We have YouTube, and we do have Spotify in the committee. So uh, they're going to be looking at this, and we'll see if they can, can accept it. And um, it's an evolutionary process. I won't get into it. Let's see. Um, do you, uh, and we're recommending, we're recommending album normalization as giving a better experience than doing uh, track normalization. And uh, we have a maximum true peak level to uh, uh, minimize clipping when using lossy encoders. And that's the gist of it. That's all of it. The rest of the document is explanations and uh, best practices and things like that. Bob, maybe maybe you should add that in the best practices for uh, music content, um, we may uh, recommend to um, to to stream music a little louder than speech, and the minus eighteen loves target is for the full integrated program loudness, 
let's say you have a, a radio broadcast station that also streams online or you have a podcast station or whatever that would be the minus 18 loves target at yes. the moment as the intermediate target level and then still music streams um or mu part where music is part of a full stream the, the music uh programmed parts would be a little louder than that speech and we tend to um, to recommend let's say about three lu above speech but this is all work in progress still yeah it's going we will talk about speech and music and podcasts in the best practices section. Right. Yeah. So this is all work in progress. Yeah, it's it's work in progress. And actually, it's interesting. It relates to a question we have here um, asking about saying that playback devices, devices such as headphone amps in phones are sometimes too so weak that levels of minus 14 or lower uh, are in, not um, pr in, impractical, basically, for everyday use. Um, Especially in that's, Europe. Yeah, that's particularly in Europe. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, Berlin stole uh, the, um, but that's something else. That's something else that's part of the ongoing conversation. Um, there are some oh, people I who would like to go immediately to a minus twenty-four level in this recommendation, but the reason we, that it's not going that far is because of this limitation on the devices. Right. But that is going to change in future. The I believe. I mean, I believe I'm right in saying that the the way that you know that that limit on the volume is there to try and protect people's hearing. Um, to stop them damaging their hearing by listening too loud, but it's based on a, on a kind of outdated method of a continuous listening period, whereas actually music is typically only loud for shorter bursts and therefore higher levels can be allowed. Uh, go ahead, Elko, you had a comment. Yeah, maybe you can put that comment back on um, at the bottom. Oh, you want me to share that again? Yeah. Oh, no, it's the, uh, there was this. Oh, no, the other one. Okay. But it's, it's the same oh, guy, but it's another. another. Yeah. Here, we go. Here we go. There you go. That's Why? it. Yeah, so uh, let's say, let's, first of all, uh, maybe we should not call it RMS level anymore. Let's call it LUFS, so that makes the whole discussion more clear. Mm -hmm. um, you need to know that in Europe, um, there is a test signal standardized, and all devices need to comply to certain regulations uh, set up by the Senelec Committee, which is part of the European Committee. And these uh, demand that uh, any combination of earphones and, um, and, and playback device, uh, mobile playback device, together will not play a minus 10 loves test noise signal louder than 100 dBA. Well, 100 dBA is pretty loud. And so minus 10 loves uh, is about the average level that they thought popular music would be at. But at the moment we are seeing minus seven, minus six loves. So that's already uh, at least four LU louder, which would also mean uh, four dB louder, which is 104 dBA on your headphones. And you might think that's uh, that's impossible because it's a battery power device or so, but the sensitivity of these earphones is just insane. Uh, we measured in the Netherlands at uh, at the academic hospital uh, systems of just, I think it was a 30 euro MP3 player that could play up to 120 dB on that test noise, which is totally insane and, and very much damaging to the ear. Um, so to get back to the minus 14 loves levels that would play only for LU, well, it's it's difficult to, of course, LU is not DBA, but let's say it's similar on noise. Uh, so um, that would mean if the, if the music would be pink noise like in spectrum, uh, we can say that uh, the minus 14 loves track would sound at 96 DBA. And if you are listening to music at 96 DBA and it's not loud enough, you better move to some other place because it's crazy loud. Um, minus 23 loves on the other hand, which is the standard for broadcasts in uh, Europe, um, that would end up uh, 13 decibels below it, and that's 87 dBA, well, still uh, with a big noise uh, like uh, average signal, and 87 could be lowish. 
uh, if you're in a, in, a, in a noisy environment. And this is the whole discussion for broadcasters that they would love to have higher levels for broadcasts. And they're all thinking about minus 18-ish levels for the time being. Because now I want to end this whole story with the good news, and that is that the CTA, the Consumer Technology Association, has just released new recommendations for the equipment manufacturers that recommend to obey the new Senelec uh, regulations that don't say put a, 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 a true limit on, on the devices like now, but add a dose meter, a real dose meter in the device that measures the actual uh, usage of, 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 of level on your ears. And at the same time, they recommend to offer more headroom. So it will protect your hearing and at the same time make it possible to put a minus 23 loss stream at an appropriate level. So not keep it at just 85 um, dBA in a, in, a, in, a, in a noisy environment. And the combination of uh, more gain plus the dose meter will really solve this whole problem eventually because then we don't need to take um, uh, to, 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 to be afraid of being too soft because the device can handle it. It's just a matter of loudness normalization and you can do whatever you like. You can have your classical music and it sits nicely with uh, the drum and bass track that uh, masters at minus six because the normalization will all put it together. And uh, this, is th this is the real future. Uh, we will need to wait for a couple of years before all the devices will comply to that, but it will surely happen and uh, for the time being, we decided that minus 18 would work. And like I said, music usually uh, enjoyed at slightly higher levels than speech. So we will end up at an average of, let's say, minus 16 loves for the music, which means a minus 14 loves for the loudest track. And that's my story. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I, I'd like to like ask, oh, it's echoing. echoing. Hmm. Hmm. Somebody. Somebody. Somebody's headphone seems to be, uh, or a, a thin speaker, a tinny speaker is echoing. Okay, it's gone. Great. Uh, I'd like to see if Berlin Stoll is still um, watching our little stream podcast. Uh, I'd like to ask Berlin Stoll if uh, where where he is looking for, uh, working from. Are you in Europe? Are you in the U.S.? Where are you located? You can see he's still on the stream there. Great, great, great. It is going to happen. Um, there's legislation working to improve uh, future mobile devices. But I, I'm curious whether your reaction to the uh, things, uh, to the mobile device sounding low is because it's legislated in Europe or if you're listening from the US or, or which is not regula so regulated. He, he's, he says, yes, yes, he is in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and while I'm, while I'm telling you guys what's going on in the comments, um, Dave, uh, Menkohurst says, Elko, you're a real save, the real savior for dynamic range. Thank you. Um, and DF Rodriguez asks if you have a link. I presume that means to the CTA um, guidelines. CTA 2070. Please specify. I don't know what link you need. Yeah, let, let us know which link. Berlin is in Germany, by the way. Try CTA 2075. Let's Google it. Um, while we're at that, I, I want to go back to a much more general question. Um, let me let me find it here and uh, Pedro says hello guys what advice would you give to someone who's just starting mixing recording and experimenting with sounds and I guess he's talking about specifically in terms of loudness um, and I'm gonna have a go and just say don't worry too much about loudness um, I mean if, if, if anything is clear from the what we've been talking about this evening, I think it's that we're in, I, I feel like now at the intro to a Star Wars movie, we're in a time of flux. <laughs> um, in the sense, you know, everything is changing. The normalization methods are coming online and changing and improving. The device uh, limitations, such as they are, are changing. The standards are changing. The way that people respond to all of this is changing. And I think... You know, the good news for all of this is that going forwards, we are going to be able to just just do what 
works best for the music you know that's the that's the positive message of dynamic range days it's not trying to say to anybody don't master your music loud you shouldn't do this that that's bad if somebody really passionately believes their music should be super super loud then they should be free to do that what people what shouldn't happen is that people shouldn't feel pressured into having to do it in order to compete or in order to sell more records or you know to to, to fit the mold or whatever that might be the you know the the way that things are changing i mean to be honest i think that it was always that way the, even on a cd where there's no normalization at all the users just adjust the volume control to what's comfortable for them so really this whole thing is a complete red herring um and it it should just be about doing what's right for the music make you know um i saw a question earlier on saying well what are the targets and the answer is there are no targets um it's good to be aware of the reference levels that streaming services use so that you can understand what's going to happen to your music when it gets out there in the world. Um, but just because Spotify uses minus 14 or Apple uses minus 16, or maybe all of them will eventually use minus 18 or minus 24 or whatever it is, doesn't mean we have to aim our music at that target. They will make the adjustments for us. That's all right. we have to do is make sure that we can achieve the sound that we want understanding what's going to happen to it further downstream so i think you know pedro i would say experiment you know ex exactly that explore the possibilities figure out what you can do you know use the loudness penalty website if you want to understand what's going to happen if you start uploading your music um just so that you you can make sure that you can get the the artistic result that you're looking for right now but hopefully in future all of this is going to become a non-issue you know my hope is that in five or ten years you know, here we are 10 years on from the or 11 years on from the first dynamic range day. It's all still here. We're all still talking about it. The the kind of the, the, the parameters of the debate have shifted slightly, but it's still a huge issue. My hope is that if I look back in another 10 years, it'll be kind of well, what was all that about? You know, why did we all bother with all of that stuff? It's, you know, why is it an issue? It should just be about making the music sound good. Um, Elko, go. Yeah, well, I, I see uh, another question from Friso Koen, and uh, maybe you can put that up. Wait, before you do, I, I had something to add to Pedro, if you don't mind. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Put, put Pedro's back up. Pedro, I would say uh, a good piece of advice is to educate your ears. Educate your ears, listen to a lot of great recordings, and also try to learn what the, what the sonic differences are between a high degree of peak to loudness or peak to um uh what does the s stand for again i'm sorry peak well, it is. it's peak to short-term loudness PSR. Oh, peak to short-term loudness uh differences uh do and make sure you you recognize when transients come through and when they're being affected so you can learn to get your gain your in your tastes for mixing what you're going for and not sacrifice transients if possible that's what I, I would. I think that's great advice. And actually, just to, I mean, having get, gone on my huge rant there about just to do what sounds best, I do have some helpful guidelines for people starting out with this. I'm sure most people listening to this already know my helpful guidelines. Um, you can find them at productionadvice.co.uk forward slash how dash loud. But I think if you, basically the advice is to decide where the loudest point of your music is, decide how loud to make it, and then balance everything else relative to that musically. And if the loudest moments are reasonably consistent, I mean, there might be some point on the album where you feel that that's the absolute peak, but otherwise keep the loudest moments reasonably consistent and judge everything else musically, you'll be in great shape. And for me, the loudest you ever wanna go, if you have the peaks at minus one as we're recommending is minus 10, minus 11 short-term loudness. Um, for those sections, but I say that that blog post is there. Um, and get an LUFS meter to be able get to get an LUFS meter. <coughs> yeah. um, Elka, was it this question that you were yes. asking? About? Yes. So I haven't read it yet. Do you have any tips on mastering songs which have huge dynamics between verses and chorus, but small dynamics in the choruses themselves, which makes a good integrated LUFS, but uh, low loudness in the chorus, I guess? Yes manually turn the choruses up and put some expander on the choruses yeah i i think that the, the interesting question of course is that will mastering become more or less difficult when you allow for more dynamics less difficult 
Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to push back against that slightly. I just think, um, so one of my favorite albums for sound, purely for sound, is Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd, um, which I think is kind of down at the minus 14, minus 16 kind of, but mind you, I have the original CD release, which probably doesn't even peak at zero. Um, but the thing that strikes me when I listen to that is it absolutely works, um, but I think it's incredibly challenging to get it to work. In the, I think it gets more challenging to get things to work when you have more dynamics to work with. I have a suspicion that the reason that lots of kind of less experienced engineers um, like to mash everything through a multiband compressor and then through a limiter yeah, is work. it can just kind of iron out all these mm -hmm. kind of problems and flaws in the mix. I think, you know, th that's why I always advise people not to have compression certainly not multiband compression on the on the mix bus when they're mixing because it's it's kind of like a crutch you know you can you end up relying on this thing rather than developing the skills to get it to work anyway so if the goal is to to be the best recording and mixing engineer you can be i think the less of that stuff you can use um the better but well, i, what, I me, what i meant by less challenging uh is that it gives you more freedom when you allow yourself more dynamics but it's a lot of work to uh to fine tune that but you have the freedom and when you give yourself the freedom it's it's easier I, I would also think that maybe you 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 would use less limiting but the demands on your compression skills doesn't change much because it's still the compression is much more about your experience and how it will work yeah. in various circumstances blah 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 Takes years to... the limiter is just a stupid thing that you would normally never use. It's just yeah, why why a limiter? There's no need for a limiter. Yeah, it's Unless it's very you interesting. You use it for sound purpose, of course, but yeah, I mean, I actually had um, a client in the last few months kind of challenge me. I, I I did a master and sent back my first. I mean, he said he wanted it to be a great dynamic release, so I kind of went in knowing that I wasn't, didn't have to be concerned about loudness, um, mastered it the, the way that using my normal reference level, the way that I liked it and sent it back to him. And he kind of came back and said, actually, I think I'd like it e even more dynamic. Um, and I was kind of, well, you know, streaming services, is it going to get turned up too much? Is it going to hit Spotify's limited too much? We, we kind of talked around it and he, uh, he insisted. So I went back to it and it involved me, you know, I, so I adjusted my reference level up brought all the levels back and it was interesting to me i had a, a real it probably took me an hour or two of kind of recalibrating mm -hmm. if you like my working methods because you know everything about the way that i normally work shifted um yeah. but once i'd done it on the final result i mean it just sounded fabulous um and it just made me think again you know i mean one of the things i love about this whole so here's a positive thing about the 10 years is that we've we've moved from kind of but for me, my own personal mastering level is just edging back and back and back. You know, I remember when I first started Dynamic Range Day, then everybody was using the, the TT loudness meter, and it, it was like, don't go any lower than DR8. Well, DR8, right. in modern standards, would mean peaking at zero with the short-term loudness at minus eight. Um, and now I'm saying the absolute loudest you should go is minus 10 with peaks at minus one. But actually, you know, in terms of the integrated loudness, that probably means that the lots of songs on an album with ver varied material are probably down at minus 12 minus 14 or minus 16 and it's the, and the further back we get the, the better it starts to sound you know so um yeah I, I think that's that's all positive um which is which is great maybe that's a good place to stop because i'm aware that it's very late for for old elko who is an hour ahead of us over there on mainland europe um and we've been going for a good hour and a half um i don't know how many people are, are still listening to us at this point um but uh thank you everybody for for being here and um for encouraging me to to keep going with dynamic range day this year and thank you elko and bob for uh for being here um you know we really appreciate your support we we all get emails kind of encouraging us and saying, keep, in, keep going, keep doing what you're doing. We are going to keep doing that um, because I think, I hope we, you know, we all see light at the end of the tunnel and hopefully we, we might eventually start to get there. Great um, job, Ian. Great job.
No, thank well, thank you, you so much, Ian, for having me. No, it's uh, it's my pleasure. Um, so, yeah, I hope you guys watching uh, enjoyed this. I will. Uh, I'm aware that we haven't got to all of your questions. Um, we can all jump in, guys. This is streaming simultaneously on Facebook and YouTube. So, if you ha have any time to answer any other specific questions for you um, there. Um, the YouTube chat will take a while to come up. When we end the broadcast, this will be available as a replay. The chat usually takes an hour or two to come through, but then uh, it's possible to scroll back through it and, and see it. Um, yeah, let's all keep the conversation going. Um, and uh, if you enjoyed this, find it uh, useful or interesting, please share it um, with uh, anybody you think might like it. It's uh, it's midnight here, so dynamic range day is done for me. But for those uh -huh. of you in the time zones, feel free to uh, keep keep it going uh, as long as you see fit. So uh, thanks again, and, and uh, please stay safe, everybody. Oh yes, God, absolutely, yes. stay inside, stay safe, um, and uh, just share lots of dynamic range day stuff. Take care. Thanks bye everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening. Bye everybody. Bye bye.